Gentlemen, how you doing today? I was asked to make a video on isometric and PNID drawings, their symbols and the methodologies for making those. So today we're going to talk about isometric drawings. I have here a sample isometric drawing that I have made. Understand, gentlemen, that the audience that you guys represent is quite diversified. It represents not only all the corners of the country, but literally the globe. The last time I checked, there's something like 38 countries represented watching these videos. Still, quite not, uh, still a very small audience. I understand that. But understand, gentlemen, that when I talk about something, it's what I'm familiar with and what I have experienced in my travels. Um, I have traveled and I have seen a lot of facilities. But understand that what I represent today here as experience is that. It's my experience. It's not the only way to do something. It's the way I'm used to doing it. And some of the places I go, they have their own legends and symbols. And I use those when I'm there. Um, when left to my own devices, these are the ones I gravitate to. And I want to explain how that works. Let's go over the basics of drawing. The upper left-hand corner, there is a direction arrow. This one happens to be north, and it points to the upper right. Now, I'm sure some of you will tell me how terrible of a human being I am because I drew it that way. Others will completely agree with me. Now, gentlemen, this is not religion. This is convenience. So when I draw the, a direction arrow, it's because that's what's most convenient for making the drawing. And understand that I make a drawing to be used for others most of the time. So I've made the drawing as I would understand someone else to use it. It's not always the case for equipment. Because a lot of times you can walk up to a piece of equipment in multiple directions. I've got a, a rather famous drawing because I caught a lot of flack for it one time when I turned it in. I made a drawing of some rock catchers or rock filters at the bottom of a TCC unit. The only way to walk up to that piece of equipment or sets of equipment is from the south. As a result, instead of having a north arrow, it's got a south arrow. And... When f people first saw that drawing turned in, they thought I'd lost my dang mind. But the first time that drawing was used, someone realized, hey, wait a minute. The only way to approach that equipment is to scoot between the skirt of that tower and the base of that structure. And right there, lo and behold, are a matched A and B set of rock filters. And all the piping is accessible from the north while facing south. And as a result, the drawing is drawn in the only orientation that would make sense to use it. And if I had transposed it to any other direction, there was a high likelihood that the equipment would be transposed and the UT would be taken and recorded incorrectly. So understand when you make these drawings, Take a moment to think about who your audience is going to be. We don't, none of us, live inside a bottle. Um, what we do is, is definitely going to be used by others, and it may be decades later. So take a moment to think about who your intended audience will be. Is it going to be another API? Is it going to be a senior API or an engineer? Is it going to be a, a couple of UT technicians who are brand new in the field? Recognize your target audience needs to be addressed, okay? So let's talk about that. Um, when I drew this, I intentionally drew some Easter eggs and realized that if I leave them, uh, there will be people who are confused. So let's talk about them. All right, we've got, we've got a standard heat exchanger here with some at piping attached to the bottom and the top of the channel, 
right? I didn't draw the shell or the bundle side of this for this, this discussion. I just wanted to throw some piping up here. And notice I've labeled the support column. Uh, in a lot of facilities, the columns actually have numbers. That really helps people find where you're at. You know, a, a plot plan will get you close and uh, to make certain you're, you're exactly where you're at, especially if the piping is running quite a ways, it always helps to detail in some other information. Notice here my pipe, my, my piping originates and terminates somewhere else. I've drawn a box with the letter A showing it comes from this other exchanger and that as it goes through the exchanger and continues, it goes off page and I've labeled that again. If I'm drawing multiple sheets, I would of cor course n number my sheets and I would have a page number for where the origination and the continuation is. Whatever information you can help for the person using your drawings will be helpful. Um, you know, there's a balancing act of too much information versus not enough. But rest assured, if in doubt, err on the more than less side. Um, you notice on the upside of this, we've got a 4 inch 150 gate valve, a 4 inch T with a concentric 4x3 reducer going to a 3 inch gate valve used for some drainage piping. Obviously, they're not using it for a flush back because that would probably be on the bottom so you could actually flush the bundle out also and it'd be closer to the ground. But that's just how I drew it. Um, notice I didn't put a reducer between the T and that first flange, but I labeled it 3 inch 150. Originally I drew this as an Easter egg, but realized eh, I might confuse quite a few of you, so I figure we'll talk about it. It continues on. I've got a, another weld as a small pup piece. Goes up to a vertical to horizontal 90. It runs over. We've got a 45 degree fitting mounted in the horizontal position. I've noted that so that no one's confused about what direction we've got there. And then my next vertical I also labeled. This isn't always necessary, but it's always real good to do this. That way it's most clear that no, the piping changed back to running vertical, and it was with a 90 degree fitting. I've also shown a support here welded to the column that we've already talked about. Notice it continues, and I, I showed which line number and which PNID number this continues on. A lot of times I'm only drawing the detail for a specific piece of equipment or a specific location of piping, and I'll tie that into either another isometric drawing or simply to a PNID line, you know, whatever, whatever I'm working with at the time. Notice over here in the corner, I've got the date, right? Always, always throw a date on there. There's nothing more confusing than when you're looking at a drawing and it doesn't match what's there in the field. But if you've got a date, you've got an idea of, okay, well, maybe they've had major revisions to the piping since then. And any drawing you make, you should be proud enough to put your name legible on a drawing. Notice I put on here, Mr. Eric, and my API number. You know, whether you're a, a level two or you're an API, put on there uh, who you are. And uh, that'll give people some confidence as to who drew it and why. Um... We can talk about some of the most common symbols used for valvings, uh, gates and globes. Notice it's just a simple X. A gate is the X and a globe is the X with a colored in circle in the center. It's the easiest way to draw a globe valve and it's probably the most common. Uh, a ball valve is either the X with a circle, open circle on top of it, or simply a circle in between the the body. Um, both of them are fairly common. Uh, I find myself using both of them not quite interchangeably, but pretty common. It seems like the facilities I go to, half of them use one, half of them use the other. I try to use what a facility uses, but uh, 
um, I gravitate back to the one and the other. A plug valve, a needle valve. Needle valves are usually common only for instrumentation and uh, small sampling locations, but they're a colored in uh, triangle at the top of an ordinary gate valve indicator. Check valve. Um, this is a contentious, um, seemingly contentious drawing set. Um, some of the places I've been, they've been absolutely adamant about nobody detailing a swing check with just an arrow and a pivot pin. And other places I've been, if you drew it like this, they would think that was a reducer instead of a check valve. So understand that there are different differences in symbols and that you need to be aware of what people are using at a location. Um, to me it seems like most of the places I go they're using swing checks or weighted swing checks and this is the way to detail it. But I have been places where that was the the only acceptable method for detailing it. Look through some other people's drawings and see what other people are using. Look at the legend at the beginning of a set of drawings especially for PNIDs. I know we're talking about isometrics here, but you can get a lot of guidance by looking through other sets of a facility and see what other people are using. Um, I don't see a butterfly very often anymore. Um, they used to be pretty common in the cooling water sides and in the chemical sides. They're not so common anymore in um, oil and gas. So... It, uh, if you if you've never seen one of that don't be don't be too alarmed um, reducers a lot of people just use a, a standard um, triangle for a reducer whether it's eccentric or concentric some places draw them all as this detail and then label them er or cr for concentric reducer or eccentric reducer some places get so fancy as to draw them with a flat side for the flat side down or the flat side up if it's an eccentric reducer. Um, when in doubt, draw it and label it. And if, if you see one labeled in any of these and labeled either CR or ER, rest assured that you'll be able to figure it out. So will someone else using your drawing. Control valves. There's lots of different ways to draw them, and it seems like most people, even if it's a globe body control valve, draw it just like this with the, the mushroom-shaped head. You know, in the old days where everything was diaphragm controlled, either pneumatic or pneumatic over hydraulic or straight hydraulic, and nowadays we see, you know, electric linear actuators and other methods if you label it like this as either a globe valve or a gate valve bodied control valve people will understand what you're talking about um, some people draw it as a, uh, a plug valve they, they would draw it as a plug valve but with a mushroom head without coloring in the center um, that would give us a a, a really good uh, indicator for um, a plug bodied control valve instead of a globe or ball actuated control valve. It's, it's not that critical, um, but it, it, does, it does show that you're paying attention as to how you're making your drawings. Um, these are all been drawn as just straight valves. Notice I drew flanges here. It's very uncommon to see a welded in control valve. They do exist um, um, in, in all aspects of industries we visit, but you know, by and large they'll be flanged. Um, same way with a, a relief valve. A relief valve is simply two triangles at represented right angles with the spring feather hat. Um, it's always good to label not only the flanges but the size of the relief valve. Noticed here I, I just wrote what size it was uh, with the orifice 
Um, I didn't list the rating or the manufacturer. Normally I would do both of those. You know, if it's a consolidator or a Crosby, I would label it as such and then list what the serial number, the last rebuild date, and the set pressure. And since I'd have my inspection camera with me, I'd probably take a picture of the tag and the body and its installation. It's not a bad habit to get into. You don't need to get crazy with that camera. You can just label all that information straight on your drawing. But here I haven't labeled all of it. Down here in the corner, you see that I've drawn four different ways, three different sets of welds. Butt welds are almost exclusively drawn as colored in circles because usually we're involved once the piping has been installed. Occasionally we'll be following stuff as it's being made and instead of being colored in circles we'll see open circles. And that's the difference between a a shop or previously made weld versus a field or tie-in. Um, some places for a tie-in they'll actually make the the four little marks to really call out the attention to a location for a tie-in. Um, there's no wrong way to do it, it's just a matter of how places are used to doing it. Same way with drawing socket welds and threaded piping. I, I try my best not to have to deal with threaded piping, but occasionally I, I still find myself both drawing it and inspecting it. Anyway, um, these are some of the things that, uh, that you know, are... There are all kinds of tricks and, and things to remember when you're making isometric drawings, but the main thing is is to uh, um, to draw it on an isometric, and if it's anything other than an ordinate direction change, to label it. Um, kind of like I did here for the 45 degree horizontal offset. Um, this is a little template I carry. I've been carrying this one for years. Seems like these are about the only ones you can find anymore. These 458s. Um, works good for most things. Um, most time I've got a big pad or loose isometric paper. I print a lot of it myself just so I've got it. Um, that way I don't have to worry about finding a pad of it. In fact, my tally books I have printed in isometric grid. And as a result, it's just tracing the lines that are actually on the paper. You know, you don't need you don't need a fancy template. It comes in handy for doing stuff, but I find most of the time I, I just draw it freehand. It looks it, but, you know, th this drawing is not the world's cleanest drawing, but it's also probably not the slowest drawing made on the planet. So balance your drawings as to quality of drawing versus speed of generation. Um, I'm sure there's lots and lots of different opinions about all the aspects of this, but uh, this kind of covers the the highlights like I was asked to do by some people. Anyway, if you guys find yourself here at the end, I, I appreciate it. Um, almost none of you do, so um, there is that. I don't know how to hide Easter eggs in these videos so that you guys actually watch the whole thing. I don't know how to make it more engaging. I guess if you guys have some ideas, um, I'd love to hear about them. Throw them in the comment section. Anyway, thanks for coming along. Thanks. Bye.